On the 4th of July 2012, scientists working at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva announced the discovery of the 21st century. They had found the Higgs boson. For months, the popular imagination was warped by stories of a god particle as screenwriters and TV presenters struggled to understand the finer points of particle physics. To try to isolate what some people call the god particle, but there are implications for energy the research. God particle? It seems the most important discovery of the century may also be the least well understood. In this video, I will give a brief introduction to modern particle physics, hopefully at a level that someone without a strong background in physics can understand, and explain why the discovery of the Higgs boson is so important. As with any good story, in order to understand this we have to take a step back by a hundred years to the start of the 1900s, a time when, as ever, physicists thought that they knew everything. Newton's laws provided a simple and elegant description of everything that we know in the world. James Clerk Maxwell had unified theories of electricity and magnetism into one theory of electromagnetism and there seemed few questions that physicists couldn't answer. The first was the nature of light. Some theories suggested that light was a particle, others suggested that it was a wave. You see, there are certain properties that are characteristic of anything that behaves as a wave. We see these in waves in the sea, you see them with sound waves, and you also see them with electromagnetic waves like light or x-rays or infrared or anything like that. At this point in time, it had been discovered that both of these theories fitted the nature of light in different circumstances. You see, you could describe light like a particle that travels straight in one direction, like light coming out of a torch, for instance, which would provide some evidence that it may be behaving like a particle. That being said, there are also many circumstances in which light definitely behaves like a wave, especially when we look at other branches of the electromagnetic spectrum other than just visible light. For example, when you pass light through a small slit, it will diffract out, propagating out in lots of different directions rather than just passing through in a straight line. If you pass it through more than one slit, then the light coming out of each of those will interfere with each other and produce a diffraction pattern as a result. So there were two different ways of describing light that had been discovered, both of them good in different circumstances. Another significant problem faced by physicists was why electrons in atoms fall into discrete energy levels. You see, by using Newton's laws, we could solve for the motion of an electron around an atomic nucleus like how we do for a planet. You simply solve Newton's second law, F equals ma, for an electric force to attracting the electron to the nucleus, just like you would solve for a gravitational force attracting a planet to the sun, for instance. However, when you do this, you find clearly that the electron could be orbiting the atomic nucleus at any possible radius and hence have any possible value of kinetic energy. But when we study electrons in atoms, we see that they only take certain discrete values of energy. The early 1900s was a golden age for discovery in physics and the answer to both of these questions came soon and also more or less by accident. As I mentioned a minute ago, Waves have certain characteristic properties, and one of them is that waves passing through thin slits will propagate outwards. This is called diffraction. In fact, if you place lots of these slits together and pass waves through all of them, they will produce a characteristic interference pattern as a result. This particular setup is called the diffraction grating, and you can use it to study the, different, the distance between those little slits. So for example, rather than using a man-made diffraction grating, you could use a crystal. And this is what physicists do in order to calculate the distance between atoms in a crystal. Now, what happened in the early 1900s was that physicists were doing this experiment with X-rays and they were passing X-rays through a crystal in order to calculate the distance between the atoms in that crystal. And the way that they were generating these X-rays was by bombarding a plate with electrons um, and the, the energy of those electrons when they hit the plate would produce photons, although this was they weren't known to be a particle called photons at the time, but it would produce light as a result from the energy loss, that would or x-rays in fact, but that's just a, a type of light, that would then pass away from the plate through the diffraction grating and produce an interference pattern on the wall. And one day these physicists were doing the experiment and they realised when they got to the end of the experiment that their plate had fallen off and they had been bombarding the diffraction grating 
with electrons, which they thought should only ever behave like a particle. But these electrons had produced the same interference pattern on the wall that light would have done, proving that those electrons must have been behaving like a wave when they passed through the diffraction grating. This sounds weird, and it is weird, and this is the beginning of quantum mechanics, which is probably the most misunderstood theory ever. It does, however, provide a new way of calculating what the energy levels in an atom could be, because rather than solving for the motion of a particle around the nucleus, we can instead construct an equation like Newton's second law that we can solve, but that instead describes a wave with some kind of potential energy, as in you have a field like a gravitational field or an electric field, and that has an influence on a wave as it's passing around the atom. The equation that was that is used is called the Schrodinger equation and was derived obviously by Schrodinger, but there's a few other names to be mentioned here. Uh, Heisenberg, who was another physicist, also created a similar equation at the time. And in solving this equation, they could calculate the energy levels in an atom almost perfectly. There were a few corrections that had to be made, but this was a remarkably good theory. It also sheds some light on the question of whether light was a particle or not. Clearly, electrons could also behave as a wave, even though they were thought to be a particle, suggesting that both electromagnetic radiation and electrons, which are believed to be elementary particles, can behave both as a particle, as in as a little ball that passes in a straight line with a certain momentum, and as a wave that passes through diffraction gratings and thin slits and will interfere with itself. No discussion of physics in the early 1900s can go by, however, without a mention of Albert Einstein. In Einstein's special theory of relativity, he proved that even an object at rest still holds some energy. In fact, the energy is simply just stored in the mass of that object. Light, for instance, which is massless, only contains energy in its momentum. But something with mass has both kinetic energy, which comes from its momentum as it's moving along, and also some inherent energy. Essentially the equation E equals mc squared says that mass is just a really congealed form of energy. It's like you get a load of energy and you squash it into a ball and then you've got something with mass. That's kind of how I interpret what that means. But what it also means is that if you have some kind of nuclear reaction that results in a change of mass in total, then that extra mass can be converted into energy. And this is how nuclear power stations and nuclear bombs work. The daughter nuclei, as in the nuclei produced when a uranium nucleus splits, have a lower total mass than the original uranium nucleus, which means that there's a difference in mass, or due to the equation E equals mc squared, there is a difference in the total energy. And so that extra bit of energy has to be released as electromagnetic radiation, basically, as gamma rays, which is what causes uh, the deadly radiation in a nuclear power station or in a nuclear explosion. These discoveries gave scientists not only a new understanding of atoms, but also the ability to make huge leaps in computing power, develop new ways of understanding chemical reactions, and create weapons that could level cities in a matter of seconds. On top of this, it also led to a new understanding of particle physics, as scientists questioned what new particles could be created and how these particles interacted with new undiscovered forces. When you try and break something up, how far can you go? We all know that somewhere along the way, the answer is atoms. You break something up into molecules, each of those is made up of atoms themselves. But what happens when you try and break up an atom? Physicists study these kind of questions through experiments called scattering experiments. What they do is they fire small particles at a, an individual atom and they make a guess about how they think the atom is structured. A guess like it's a little cube or it's a little sphere or it's made up of lots of little spheres. And then from that guess, they make a prediction and compare it with the experiment by studying how many individual particles bounce off in a particular direction. So you kind of study lots and lots of different angles and see how many particles are getting bounced off in that particular direction, and then see how that compares with your guess. So this is what physicists did. 
in order to try and figure out what an atom is made of. And they found, as we all know, that it's made of protons and neutrons, protons being positively charged particles and neutrons being neutrally charged particles. What happens when you do the same experiment with protons and neutrons? This gets a lot harder, but we can still do similar experiments by bombarding something that's made of protons and neutrons with something else that's made of protons and neutrons and try and probe the inner structure of one of those protons and neutrons. As a result, physicists discovered new elementary particles. They found that protons and neutrons are just slightly different combinations of two elementary particles called quarks, in particular the up quark and the down quark. A single proton contains two up quarks and one down quark. The up quarks each have a charge of plus two thirds relative to the charge of the electron, and the down quark has a charge of minus one third. So you can see from that, if you add two thirds to two thirds and take away a third, you will get plus one, giving it the right charge for a proton. And likewise for a neutron, you might be able to guess, that's made of one up quark and two down quarks. So you have plus two thirds, then take away a third, take away another third, gives you a charge of zero. Over time, physicists have used this to build up a set of particles that we call the standard model of particle physics. They're broadly split into three big groups, quarks, leptons, and bosons. The next quark after the up and down quarks to be discovered was called the strange quark, so-called because it had some new properties which were strange in comparison to the previous two. Following that, another strange quark was discovered, which they decided to call the charm quark. The next quark to be discovered was the beauty quark, which was later renamed the bottom quark after a counterpart called the top quark with the same charge as an up quark was discovered. This means that the quarks are separated into two different groups, the up type quarks being the up quark, charm quark and top quark, each with a charge of plus two thirds and getting increasingly more massive as you go on through that list. And likewise, the down type quarks with charge minus a third being the down quark, the strange quark and the bottom quark. We should also mention at this point that each one of these quarks comes with a corresponding anti-quark as predicted by Paul Dirac, which has the same properties as that quark, so the same mass uh, and other properties of elementary particles but it has opposite charge. So the anti-up quark, for instance, has a charge of minus two thirds and the anti-down quark has a charge of plus one third. So that's kind of how that works. Next up are the leptons, which I would describe, I guess, as electron-like particles because the electron is kind of the most simple one of all of them. Uh, there, are uh, there are leptons with charge and there are leptons called neutrinos which have no charge and also no mass. The next electron up, sorry, the next lepton up from the electron is the muon, which again, like the electron, has a charge of minus one, but a slightly bigger mass. These are particles that are produced in the upper atmosphere when solar rays hit uh, the ions high up in the Earth's atmosphere, and they are transmitted down to the Earth's surface, which you can detect. Um, and then the last of these type of lepton is the tau, which is a very massive particle with a charge of minus one, just like the electron. And then each one of those has a corresponding neutrino, which that lepton can decay into by a force called the weak force, which we will be coming to very soon. Basically, the weak force allows them to decay into a neutrino by taking away some of the charge, because it has to decay to a neutral particle, and also some of the energy, because um, electrons muons and tau particles have a large mass, so some of that mass has to be taken away in energy by the weak force. I should also mention here that each one of these leptons, including the neutrinos, has an antiparticle with the opposite charge. Now that doesn't make very much sense for a neutrino, given that they're neutrally charged, but there are other properties as well, which the antineutrinos have the opposite property in correspondence to a, a normal neutrino, if that makes sense. I will try and explain that better in a minute once we have explained what all of the different forces are. So on that topic, 
the forces between elementary particles are transmitted by the other section of the standard model, which I mentioned, the bosons. The first of these, I suppose, is the photon, the particle that transmits light, and as a result, the particle that transmits the electromagnetic force. As we all know, in the electromagnetic force, two things of the same charge are repelled and two things of opposite charge are attracted to each other. So how does that actually work? Basically, in order for two same charged particles to be repelled, they bounce a photon between them and then move away. That transfers some of the momentum because the first one that comes along releases some momentum in one direction and moves away in the other direction, as in an equal and opposite reaction. And then the other particle absorbs the photon and takes the momentum of that photon with it and moves away in the opposite direction. The way that particles are attracted to each other, I should perhaps give by an explanation of an effect. As an electron moves towards a positively charged atomic nucleus, it slows down, hence losing some energy. Some of this energy is lost due to the increase in the potential energy of the electron. And as the electron has to change direction of motion in order to slow down and orbit the charged nucleus, it releases that momentum as a photon. This type of radiation is called Bremsstrahlung radiation, which is a German word meaning breaking radiation, because that's literally what the electron has done. It's basically braked as it's come into some, as it's moved past something that it's attracted to and has released a photon in order to do that. So that's an explanation of how these bosons actually transmit a force. These bosons only transmit forces between particular types of particles though. The photon, being the, char the, being the carrier for the electromagnetic force, only transmits that force between particles with an electric charge, obviously. So that includes all of the quarks and all of the charged leptons, being the electron, the muon and the tau, but not the neutrinos. Next up is the gluon, which transmits the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is the force that holds quarks together inside protons and neutrons or other such combinations of quarks. The gluon bounces between the quarks and much in the same way that a photon bouncing between two charged particles causes them to be repelled, a gluon bouncing between two quarks causes them to be attracted. So it literally glues those quarks together, hence the name gluon. The photon and the gluon are both massless particles. However, this symmetry will change when we start to study the last two bosons, the W and the Z boson. Now, if the strong force is like the force that glues all of the bits inside an atom together, I guess the weak force could best be explained as the force which causes that to decay, not necessarily break up. In some cases, it might break up, but it can change some of those constituents. Crucially, the weak force or the carriers of the weak force can carry an electric charge. The W boson has a positively charged version and the negatively charged version. So that allows, for instance, an up quark to decay into a down quark or vice versa, or it would allow a lepton to decay into its corresponding neutrino. Now think about this. If an up quark decays into a down quark, then that could turn a proton into a neutron, which then would change the element that that atom belongs to. This is basically how radioactive decay works. And in the process, a neutrino is emitted, or sometimes an electron, but usually a lepton is emitted in this process, which it, we see in radioactive decays. In fact, uh, the electron was first identified as beta particles in electromagnetic radiation, and the neutrino was also discovered through radioactive processes. So the weak force is like the radioactivity causing force. The final fundamental force, which we haven't yet discussed, is gravity but it's not known yet how the gravitational force interacts with individual particles. And so I'm going to leave that out of this video because that's a whole other question which you could make an entire series of videos about and not get anywhere. One thing to note in this discussion though, is that the weak force appears to be behaving in somewhat of a similar way to the photon. The photon only interacts with the charged particles and the weak force bosons, being the W and the Z boson, interact with the charged particles and 
the neutrinos, so all of the quarks and the leptons, but some of those weak force carrying bosons also carry a charge. So you can see here that there's some kind of similarity between how the electromagnetic force works and how the weak force works, because otherwise the weak force wouldn't be able to carry an electric charge, which is a property of the electromagnetic force. These kind of questions led to a groundbreaking work in physics called the electroweak unification, in which two of these forces, the electromagnetic and the weak force, were combined into a description of a single force called the electroweak force. In quantum mechanics, two particles can never be in the same state. In an atom, electrons take up different energy levels and different suborbitals of each energy level, each of those suborbitals with a different value of angular momentum and a different energy. However, when we study the number of electrons in each suborbital, we find that there are two electrons per suborbital. In order to explain the fact that there are two particles in this one state, physicists introduced the concept of spin, which was later found to correspond to the intrinsic angular momentum of an electron. You can imagine this like an electron orbiting an atom is like a planet orbiting a star, and the electron spin is like the rotation of the planet itself. It has some intrinsic angular momentum. The two different spin states are called spin up and spin down. This is explained as a vector. If you kind of use your, your hand, if it's rotating round in that direction, then the spin points upwards in that direction. And if it's rotating in that direction, the spin points down in that direction. So the spin is actually a vector pointing in a particular direction with an x, y, and a z component. When physicists discovered that there was two different types of particle in the nucleus of an atom, they first of all conjectured that these were just two different states of one particular particle. Protons and neutrons have very similar mass, so to start with, it wasn't recognised that the mass was different, and they may well have just been different states of the same particle, one with positive charge and one with neutral charge. They named these two different states isospin states in comparison to the two different spin states of an electron in an atomic orbital. Now that the mass difference between protons and neutrons has been discovered, and therefore they cannot be the same particle and are instead consist of smaller particles, the up and down quarks, the concept of isospin to describe nucleons is now outdated. However, a similar concept still exists in fundamental physics in order to describe the weak force. The weak force can change different types of quarks to other kinds of quarks and particular types of leptons to other kinds of leptons. And specifically, it can change an up-type quark to a down-type quark or vice versa by carrying away some positive or negative charge and it can change an electron-type lepton, as in an electron, a muon, or a tau, into a neutrino, or vice versa. We label these different states as weak isospin states, with the up-type quarks having a weak isospin of plus a half, like an electron having a spin of plus or minus a half, and the down-type quarks having a weak isospin of minus a half. Then the normal leptons, like an electron, has a weak isospin of minus a half, and the neutrinos have an isospin of plus a half. This allows us to describe the connection between electric charge being a property of the electromagnetic force and the properties of the weak force. You see, all of the quarks with a weak isospin of plus a half have a charge of plus two thirds. All of the down type quarks, which have a weak isospin of minus a half, all have a charge of minus a third. Likewise, the leptons with isospin plus a half are neutral and the leptons with weak isospin of minus a half are negatively charged. This allows us to label then the weak isospin of the W bosons. In order for a W plus boson to be able to carry away a positive charge from an up quark with isospin plus a half to a down quark with isospin minus a half, it must carry itself a weak isospin of plus one. Likewise, the W minus boson must carry a weak isospin of minus one. When we describe the spin of an electron, we describe it as a vector with a magnitude and a direction. In order to describe this fully, we can simply do it with the total magnitude, which we call the total spin, and then the, the magnitude along a particular direction, usually picking an arbitrary direction, the z-axis, and that is enough to describe both the magnitude and the direction of that spin. So we can do the same then for the weak isospin by describing a particle as having a total isospin 
and then a Z component of isospin. Now the W plus and the W minus bosons both have the same magnitude of isospin, but different signs, implying different directions for that vector. As in, the W boson always has a weak isospin of one, but there are two different directions for the W plus and the W minus boson, being the positive and the negative direction to give plus or minus one. In quantum mechanics, these quantum numbers change in integer units, but there is no W boson that's neutrally charged with regards to isospin. There's no W boson state that has a total isospin of one, but a, a Z component of isospin of zero. Now, although there is a neutrally charged weak boson, the Z naught boson, that has a different mass to the other weak bosons. So that particular particle cannot be the isospin zero form of the W boson because it has to be a different particle in itself. There is also no boson that exists for the weak force that has a zero total isospin. The only bosons that we have to carry forces, including the weak or the electromagnetic force, are the W plus and minus as discussed already, the Z naught boson and the photon. The idea of the electroweak unification is to conjecture that there actually are bosons that may exist at higher energies that take the values of total isospin 1 and Z components of isospin 0 and a particle with a total isospin of 0. And then through some kind of mixing, the photon and the Z naught boson are generated by a quantum superposition of those two original bosons with the weak isospin properties that we don't find for the W plus and the W minus boson. In order to describe this quantum superposition, we take the photon as being a combination of a state representing W naught, which is the particle with total isospin one and Z component zero, and a particle called B naught, which is the particle with a total isospin of zero. And the magnitude of this vector has to be one, which means that we can represent the coefficients in the real space as trigonometric functions, as in represented as angles effectively. We can do the same for the Z naught particle and describe this entire mixing as a rotation with a given rotation matrix. This rotation is called a Weinberg rotation, or Weinberg for German speakers, and what it essentially says is that the photon and the Z naught boson exist within the space of the B naught and W naught bosons, but we observe them for linear algebra fans through a change of basis, as in we observe them using a basis that's rotated by um, an angle theta with respect to the basis of those states, the B naught and the W naught bosons. Now this theory very elegantly explains how these bosons come about and how the weak force and the electromagnetic force can be aspects of the same force. However, there's one fundamental flaw to this. The photon is a massless particle, and yet the Z boson and the W bosons are not massless. On top of that, the Z boson and the W boson have different masses. So how do we reconcile this? How can we represent the photon, a massless particle, as a superposition of a W and a, a B boson, which must have mass, or else the Z naught boson couldn't generate mass? It could also be the other way around, that the W naught and the B naught bosons don't have mass, but somehow the Z naught boson does have mass. And if the W naught boson in this space doesn't have mass, then how come the W plus and W minus bosons, which are just the same particle with their spin oriented in a different direction, how can they have mass? This problem is solved by the Higgs mechanism, and this is where the Higgs boson really comes into play. The Higgs mechanism solves this essentially by suggesting that in the early universe, less than a second after the Big Bang, all of the bosons were massless. But as a result of some phase transition as the universe cooled, the weak force bosons gained mass. In order to answer the question of how the weak force bosons could have mass, we first of all need to answer why any particle at all has any mass. Peter Higgs in 1964, along with several other scientists, suggested an answer to this. They suggested that there is a field called the Higgs field that permeates the universe. Quarks and the heavy leptons interact with this field by absorbing and emitting particles called a Higgs boson, a new type of boson, to carry this force. They then suggested that as the average temperature of the universe cooled, the Higgs field's 
coupling to the weak force bosons went from being zero to having a positive value. Therefore, those bosons at a cool, in a cooler universe will absorb Higgs bosons and gain mass. The way that this works is as follows. The value of the Higgs field coupling to the weak force bosons is represented by the letter phi. This, the solution to the value of phi is found by minimising some potential which we call v, using the equation v is equal to mu squared phi squared plus lambda phi to the power of 4. In the case that mu squared and lambda are positive, this isn't very interesting. The only minima is at phi equals 0. This is the condition of the early universe in which there was no coupling of the weak force bosons to the Higgs field and those bosons didn't have mass. The interesting case occurs when lambda equals zero and mu squared is less than zero as the temperature of the universe cools. At these values we find a positive and negative minima with the positive value corresponding to a real physical value. As a result a phase transition has occurred and the value of the coupling of the Higgs field to the weak force bosons has taken on a non-zero value. Therefore, the weak force bosons will now absorb Higgs bosons in order to gain mass and interact with the Higgs field. Now, although at a first glance it seems like a bit of a fudge, the Higgs field is crucial to understanding how these bosons can gain mass and more importantly, to actually make sense of the standard model and make everything fit together neatly. In order to prove that this model actually works though, physicists needed to find some kind of experimental evidence that the Higgs field really did exist. The only question was, in order to prove that the Higgs boson really did exist, how do you make one? Inside a proton, in order to hold the quarks that make up the proton together, gluons bounce between each of the different quarks, as I mentioned earlier, gluing these quarks together. One property that particles like photons or gluons or any force carrying boson have is that they can spontaneously split into a particle and an antiparticle that then annihilate and produce that same, part, that same boson again. If we can study the particles that bounce between these quarks inside a proton and the antiparticles that they generate, can we figure out a way of causing an interaction that can produce a Higgs boson? Now, as the Higgs boson can interact with any particle and leave its momentum unchanged, the Higgs boson itself must have zero angular momentum or zero spin. This, coupled with a few other facts about quantum mechanics, allows us to predict four different interactions that could potentially produce a Higgs boson. The first of these is gluon-gluon fusion, in which two gluons produce antiparticles, antiquarks, and these antiparticles then collide. If they have a high enough energy, they can produce a Higgs boson, which has a mass that's predicted by the mathematics of quantum field theory to be very large. Therefore, this collision is going to have to have a very high energy. The next is quark-antiquark fusion. In this case, usually top-anti-top -top quark fusion, because with a higher mass, they carry the highest energy. Two gluons each split into a particle-antiparticle pair, and then from these, one of the particles and one of the antiparticles collide with each other and if they have a high enough energy they can produce a Higgs boson. Next up is vector boson fusion. Vector boson describes the weak force bosons which have a positive value of total spin and therefore their spin is made up as a vector. Essentially bosons can be emitted by quarks or leptons at any point. There's not a limit to how many of them they can emit. They can just do it at any time with a certain probability and this probability can increase or decrease depending on what other particles are around them. The way that vector boson fusion works is that two quarks each emit a vector boson as in one of these weak force bosons a W or a Z. Those particles then collide and if they both have a, a, either a positive and a negative spin or both a spin of zero they can produce a Higgs boson again if the energy of this collision is high enough. Finally, we have Higgs Strahlung, which is an analogy to the Bremsstrahlung radiation that I described earlier. A quark and an antiquark can collide, emitting a weak force boson like a W or a Z boson. And if that produced boson has enough energy, it can release a Higgs boson as breaking radiation and change the direction of its momentum, just like how an electron in the field of a positively charged particle can emit a photon and change the direction of its momentum.
All of these interactions work using the maths of quantum field theory and particle physics, but they are the only possible interactions that can produce a Higgs boson. Crucially, these interactions are all produced either by gluons or by quarks or antiquarks. Therefore, using two protons, if we can hit them together with enough energy, either the quarks in those protons upon collision could cause some kind of interaction that will produce a Higgs boson, or the gluons that bounce between those quarks could split into quark-antiquark pairs and cause a collision that could generate a Higgs boson, or those gluons by themselves could collide and again create some kind of interaction that could produce a Higgs boson. The only thing that we now need to do is find some way of colliding two protons together with a high enough energy to produce a Higgs boson. This is why the Large Hadron Collider, where the Higgs boson was discovered, is called the Large Hadron Collider. It collides protons, which are a type of hadron, hence the name. Now, when we describe the masses of individual particles in particle physics, the usual units of mass, like kilograms and grams, are basically useless because there will be so many decimal points before that number because the mass is so incredibly small that there is really no point in using those units. Instead, we use electron volts, which are a unit of a very small amount of energy, and we use the equation E equals mc squared to relate the mass of that individual particle to an electron volt, a very small unit of energy, by dividing by c squared, the speed of light squared. So the mass of the Higgs boson is described in terms of electron volts over c squared, or actually giga electron volts over c squared. The Higgs boson has a mass of 125 giga electron volts over c squared, which means that in order to have some kind of collision that can produce one, we need to accelerate these two protons to have a collision with exactly that energy in order to produce one with the highest possible probability. The mass of the Higgs boson is 125 giga electron volts over c squared. This means that in order to cause a collision that could produce one, we need to accelerate the two protons in this collision to a high enough energy that the collision energy of those two protons is at least 125 giga electron volts over c squared. Now, in order to cause this collision with the greatest probability, we need to try and calibrate everything perfectly so that the total energy of the collision is going to be equal to the mass of the Higgs boson and the mass of any other constituent particles that are created. In order to create a collision of high enough energy, we need a huge collider like the Large Hadron Collider and huge magnets in order to accelerate these protons to such high velocities. The Higgs can't be observed directly. It doesn't interact in the same way as other particles and it also has an incredibly short lifetime. However, it does, after a very short period of time, decay and often decays into two photons and these photons we can observe. And in 2012, we did. This graph shows the di photon events, so that's two photons being emitted over a series of different energies. And you can see that at a collision energy corresponding to almost exactly the mass of the Higgs boson, there's a big bump in the number of events observed at the Large Hadron Collider. This was the evidence that the physicists working there needed in order to pr prove that they had found the Higgs boson. There are four fundamental forces in the universe that physicists have identified. The electromagnetic force, the weak force, the strong force, and gravity. A big part of modern physics is trying to unite the descriptions of these four different forces into aspects of the same force to create a theory of everything. The electroweak force provides the first step in this process by uniting the electromagnetic and the weak forces. Then the Higgs field and the Higgs mechanism explains how this process can be consistent with the concept of mass and how some of the bosons that carry these forces can have mass while others don't. The next step now for physicists is to unite the electroweak force with the strong force and research is well underway in this area. However, while there are suggestions of how these forces could be united with gravity, there remains not even a shred of experimental evidence for any of the ideas that have been come up with so far. In order for a Nobel Prize in physics to be awarded, for someone who has come up with a great theory, like Higgs and his fellow scientists did back in the 1960s, there needs to be experimental proof that what they're working with isn't really just maths and really does represent something physical. I can't help but hope that there will be more great discoveries coming soon, like that of Higgs, his colleagues, and all the scientists working at the Large Hadron Collider that will give us 
a new and marvellous understanding of the fundamental forces at play in our universe. And until then, I hope you've enjoyed this video and thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.